Today we are going to Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to study today verses 22 through 32. On Friday morning, I was having breakfast with my family, and I told Haley that this is probably going to be the most difficult text that I have taught in the Gospel of Matthew. And Weston was sitting there, he was listening to what I was saying, and so he piped up and he goes, why? And I said, well, because, buddy, I'm teaching on the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. To which Weston replied, hmm, so can I have some more syrup on my waffles? Haley and I looked at each other and we were like, yeah, you know, I get it. (laughs) This is going to be a difficult one. But let's not sit here and listen, thinking the whole time about what we're going to go and eat after. Although this might be a difficult, hard to understand passage of scripture, this is God's word. So let's pay attention. And not only do I want to encourage you to pay attention, but I really want to encourage you here this morning to make sure that you've got a handout or a journal, some way that you can take notes so that way you can think it through clearly and figure out how it applies to your life. Follow along as I read our text, Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 22. It says, Then a demon-oppressed man, who was blind and mute, was brought to him, and he healed him, so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed, and they said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed, he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me Is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. This is God's word, and let's just have a brief word of prayer, and then we'll dive into this text and start studying it word for word. Father in heaven, we come before you here this morning, and we just acknowledge that this is a difficult text. It is hard to understand and has been throughout all of church history, very confusing to many people, and so we need your help. God, I have been studying it, and I thank you so much for the wisdom that it seems like you have given me by your Spirit this past week, and I pray that you would help me to be faithful, to teach and preach your word clearly, powerfully, passionately, so that way all of my brothers and sisters here this morning might see it. Spirit, we pray and we ask now that you would illuminate, open up our eyes to behold wondrous things from your law, and that you would give us ears to hear, so that way we might really and truly understand it, and hearts to receive what you have said here in your word. We commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our God is a forgiving God which is really good news for sinners like us because we need forgiveness. As a matter of fact, if you go all the way back to when God first introduces himself in Exodus 34, we hear God tell us who he is in verses 6 and 7. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. When God first introduces himself, he wants us to know about him that he forgives iniquity. Or you could go to the end of the Old Testament and you could look at Micah 7, verses 18 and 19, which says, Who is a God like you? 
pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Forgiving, though, is not just who God is. Forgiveness is what God does. On Friday night at year-end banquet, we read a little bit from Psalm 103. Well, in verses 2 and 3, David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity. See, our God forgives. He loves to do it. In the Bible, we see examples of God forgiving. God forgives murderers like Moses. God forgives prostitutes like Rahab. God forgives adulterers like David. God forgives persecutors like Saul and transforms them into the Apostle Paul. God forgives sinners like Zacchaeus, which again is really good news for all of us because we're all sinners and therefore our greatest need in this life is forgiveness. And because God is a forgiving God, out of his delight and desire to save, he gave his only son so that way we can be forgiven for all of our sins. But the Bible is also very clear that forgiveness is given when a condition is met. God's not like Oprah. You get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car, up in heaven just saying, you get forgiveness, and you get forgiveness, and you get forgiveness. No, in order to be forgiven, you need to repent of your sins and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, this might feel... Everything that I've just explained to you here this morning, like day one of class. You know, if Christianity was a class, Christianity 101, it might feel like I just went over the syllabus. What is Christianity all about? It's all about how your sins can be forgiven. And it's exactly because of those fundamental truths that I just tried to remind us of here this morning, that what we just read in Matthew chapter 12 should have been quite possibly, maybe some of the most shocking and startling words that we've ever heard from our Lord himself. Because Jesus says in this text that there is an unforgivable sin. Look back at verse 31. He says, therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age, in their lifetime, or in the age to come when they die in the next life. Jesus says in those verses that the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Now, I want to ask a question of the text and come to a conclusion through three observations. You can see that there on your handout. And in doing this, one of the things that I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to give you an example here this morning of how to study the Bible when you read it on your own. Sometimes what happens is when you're reading the Bible, you read something that you don't understand, and the temptation is just to move on to something that's easier to understand, something that feels like it jumps off the page at you that you really like, and it encourages you. Don't do that. If you're ever reading something and you don't understand it, what you should do is you should ask questions, and you should seek to understand it. And any question that you ask of the Bible, the answer to that question is found in the Bible. And so the way that you find those answers is you try to make observations, try to follow along with what's going on, understanding the context, reading slowly in order to understand. I've heard it said, and I really like it said like this, the goal is not to get through the Bible, the goal is to get the Bible through you. So here's the question of the text I want to ask this morning. What is the blasphemy against the Spirit? What is the blasphemy against the Spirit, and we're going to make our first observation from what it says in verse 22. It says, Then a demon-oppressed man 
who was blind and mute was brought to him. So a man gets brought to Jesus, and this man is oppressed by a demon. And because of the demon that's oppressing him, this man is not able to see or speak. And it says, and Jesus healed him. So Jesus performs a powerful miracle to the point that the man spoke and saw. So here's observation number one that you could write down on your handout. Jesus performs a miracle in their presence. The very person of Jesus in the flesh just performed a miracle before the crowd's eyes. So here he is in their presence, and he just performed a miracle. He healed this man who was oppressed by a demon, and now the man is able to see. Now the man is able to speak. And everybody in the crowds just saw this. Now, we've already learned in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus performs his miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit. You might remember two weeks ago, the last time that we were studying the Gospel of Matthew, we talked about Jesus on the Sabbath. And if you just look with your eyes, you can scan over verses 9 through 14, where Jesus healed a man who had a withered hand on the Sabbath in the synagogue. And it created this whole hoopla. You know, the crowds are amazed, but the Pharisees want to kill him because of what he just did. And so look at verse 15. It says, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many people followed him, and he healed them all. And he ordered them not to make this known. And so this was to fulfill, verse 17, what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. And then we get a quote from Isaiah 42. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my capital S spirit upon him. So Jesus just performed miracles. And Matthew makes it very clear where Jesus gets the power to perform his miracles is from the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus does this miracle to heal the man who is oppressed with a demon, he cannot see, he cannot speak, he did it by the power of the Spirit. And if you look at verse 23, we'll get our second observation from this text because it says, and all the people, look at the crowd's response, they were amazed. We've already studied that word in the Gospel of Matthew. It can mean astonished, or you might remember how I tried to define it for us here at United. I said that it means, wow. This is, they are like, wow. Did that really just happen? And and so they ask a question, can this be the son of David? And we've seen the significance of the son of David title in the Gospel of Matthew. It goes all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter 7 with a very important covenant promise that God made. The Davidic covenant that God said to David that from his line, from his offspring, God was going to establish a kingdom that would reign forever. And we know who the fulfillment of that promise is. It is Jesus Jesus is the Messiah. So here's observation number two. The crowds are amazed at the possibility of Jesus being the Messiah. They haven't actually committed themselves yet to Jesus. There's been no response on their part of repentance and faith and submission to him. You can see that because they ask a question. They're still wondering. They're still trying to figure it out. But they're moving down the right path. They're on the right track. They're thinking to themselves, can this guy, is it possible that he is the Messiah? And then look at verse 24 because this gives us our third observation. And notice the contrast between verse 23 and verse 24. Verse 23 says, and all the people, here's the crowd's response, they were amazed and so they say something. And then the contrast in verse 24, but when the Pharisees heard it, here's what they say. It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. So the Pharisees do not deny the power of Jesus. No, they just acknowledged he has the power to cast out demons. They recognize that. They saw it right before their eyes. But they attribute his power to the wrong source. This is observation number three. The Pharisees attribute Jesus' power to to Satan, not the Spirit. And here's another thing that you could write down on your handout. This will be important for our sermon later on. I don't know if you know what Beelzebul means. 
Beelzebul means Lord of the dwelling. Another way that you could translate it is Beelzebul means master of the house. And it's a clear reference in scripture to Satan, who is the prince of demons. Now, this is not the first time that the Pharisees have attributed Jesus' work to Satan. Let's just review two things that we've already seen. Go with me to Matthew chapter 9. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is performing more miracles, putting his power on display. And the Pharisees, here in Matthew 9, verse 34, they say the same thing. Matthew 9, 34. But the Pharisees said, in response to Jesus healing a man who was unable to speak, he cast out demons by the prince of demons. This is just uh, an important little footnote that I want to give you here at this point in the sermon. It's important to notice That although in Matthew 12, the Pharisees attribute Jesus' power to Satan, that is not the first time that they've done this. See, when you hear blasphemy against the Spirit is the unforgivable sin, it might be a common thought for people to take in their minds that there is one sin that someone can commit that causes them to cross the line. That sin is too great, it's too big, God cannot forgive it. No, we can already see this is something the Pharisees have already done. This was not a one-time thing. This became a pattern of how they were living their lives. Look at Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, our Lord Jesus is instructing his 12 apostles on what they need to know before they go to make disciples. And he's preparing them for the persecution they're about to face. And so he says this, Matthew 10, verse 25. If they have called the master of the house, which is Jesus, Beelzebul, How much more will they malign those of his household? So apparently, not only were they attributing his power to Satan, but this became such a pattern in their life, there was actually times where they called Jesus himself Satan. So this is not the first time the Pharisees have done this, but in our text in Matthew chapter 12, this is the first time that Jesus directly addresses their accusation, and he does so head on. His response is so clear. As a matter of fact, let me just give you a preview of what we're going to study next weekend. Look at Matthew 12, verse 34, because I know there are two different sections in our Bible, but this is a continuation of the same thought from Jesus based on what the Pharisees have said. Now here Jesus is addressing the Pharisees. Matthew 12, 34, he says, you brood of vipers. He's calling them out in a very clear, intense, straight up kind of a way. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus is making it very clear. Hey, what you just said about the spirit is a reflection of what's really going on in your heart. This is evil. This is wicked. What they have done here in Matthew 12 is against God. And so here's the conclusion that I think we can come to based on our observations. The blasphemy against the Spirit is seeing the Spirit perform a miracle through Jesus and attributing that work to Satan. That's the blasphemy against the Spirit. You've seen Jesus perform a miracle right before you with your own very eyes, There he is in the flesh, the Lord Jesus himself right there. You see him do it. You know that he's doing it by the power of the Spirit. And you attribute his power to the work of Satan. And because of this, it is so clear, guys, that you cannot commit the blasphemy against the Spirit today. Okay, how could you? Jesus is not here in the flesh before our very eyes performing miracles among us by the power of the Spirit. But this kind of willful rejection where you see something, you cannot deny it, you know it to be true, this willful rejection is very similar to something that we see in Romans chapter 1. So grab your Bible and go with me to Romans chapter 1. Everybody needs to see this, so everybody turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. See, in our text here this morning, Jesus is healing people literally right in front of their very eyes. And the Pharisees deny his power. I mean, let's just think about that for a second. How? How could someone deny undeniable power? 
Well, it's because they reject the truth. And the reason why is because the truth confronts the way that they live their lives. See, if Jesus is God performing his miracles by the power of the Spirit, well, then that means they either need to change and submit their lives under the truth, or they need to come up with an excuse for why it must not be true so they can willfully reject it. And in a similar way, that is what many people do today. Look at what Romans chapter 1, verse 18 describes for us. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. See, although you cannot commit the blasphemy against the Spirit today, you can suppress what you know to be true because you want to continue in your own unrighteousness. So you know something is true. You see it, you believe it, you acknowledge it as truth, but because that truth is reality, you recognize if that's true, well then what that means is I need to submit my life and change because of that truth, and because you don't want to change, you reject the truth. You suppress it in your own unrighteousness. You don't want to submit your life under the lordship of Christ Jesus. You don't want to change your ways in repentance. You don't want to follow Jesus by faith. So what do you do? You reject it all. You willfully reject it all. So that way you can continue on in sin. You have to understand something very important here this morning. If that is the continued pattern of someone's life, that becomes the unforgivable sin of today. How can that person die and be forgiven? They are denying the only provision for their salvation. If you know something is true, but because you want to continue in sin, you reject the truth. The Bible says you're hardening your heart. And if that becomes the continued pattern of how you live, and you die in that state of unbelief, there is no forgiveness for you in this life or in the age to come. That's willful rejection. Now, it's also possible for someone to blaspheme Jesus, but do so in ignorance. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. What I mean by that is this person's not saved, but they sincerely believe how they are living their life is right because they have not personally been confronted with the truth and the power of who Jesus is. See, when the Apostle Paul describes himself B.C., who he was before Christ saved him, he says that he was a blasphemer, which means he denied the truths of Christianity. And the reason why he did that is because he thought that he was genuinely serving God. So he denied Christ, but he was ignorant. He was unaware. He did not know of Christ's power and authority. Look at how Paul describes himself and his experience of salvation in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. He says, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, I received mercy. God forgave me. Why? Even though he had blasphemed, because I had acted ignorantly in my unbelief. And so the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. So Paul makes it very clear that he did blaspheme Jesus. He did blaspheme the Son of Man, but he was forgiven. And what's the reason? Because he acted ignorantly. 
When Paul says that he acted ignorantly in unbelief, he's not denying the fact that he was guilty of sin. It's simply a statement he's making indicating that he did not fully understand the truth of Christ's gospel and he was honestly just trying to protect and establish his own religion. See, he was caught up in a system. He thought that what he was doing was right and he was ignorant to the truth. But you might remember, when Paul was personally confronted by the Lord Jesus on that road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, what did he do? Man, he submitted his life under the Lord Christ Jesus. He willingly began to follow him. And what happened? He received forgiveness. So I want to ask you here this morning to evaluate yourself honestly, humbly. Have you rejected the truth? Or have you submitted your life under it? If you've rejected it, let me ask you, have you rejected it deliberately? Do you know the gospel, but suppress it in your unrighteousness? Because you do not want to give up your life. Or maybe even here this morning, you've rejected it ignorantly. You know that the pattern and path of your life right now is, I'm not following Jesus, but up until this point, you've thought, hey, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm fine. What I'm doing is right. I want to remind us of something that Jesus said in Matthew 10, 39. Whoever finds his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. See, this world thinks so backwards. The world says, if you want life, get happiness. The world says, if you want life, express yourself. The world says, if you want life, live however you feel. The world says, if you want life, do whatever you want. Jesus teaches us to think the right way. Jesus says, if you want life, surrender your life. If you want life, deny your sin and take up your cross. If you want life, follow Jesus in obedience. See, according to Jesus, losers are winners. Write this down for point number one, be a loser. that's That's a point I want every single person here today to go apply this week. Be a loser. And some of you guys are like, I'm doing a pretty good job already applying that point. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about here this morning is I believe that there is life to be found when you lose your life for the sake of Jesus Christ. Man, I talk to high schoolers all the time about becoming a Christian. And one of the common questions that I get asked when I'm having that conversation, I don't know if I get asked this question every week, but sometimes it honestly feels like it. At some point in this conversation, I'll get asked, hey, how much do I have to give up in order to become a Christian? And really at the heart of that question is, what can I keep or hold on to that I like in this life but still go to heaven when I die? Man, you and I, we need to start asking each other another question. And the question that we need to start asking each other is how much did Jesus give up so that you could become a Christian? I want you to think about it with me here this morning. If Jesus paid it all, how much to him do you owe? And do you really live like that? See, if you're the kind of person who genuinely loses your life for the sake of Christ, you can rest assured here this morning, you will never commit the unforgivable sin. Because it is not one big sin that pushes someone over the line and now God can't forgive them. It is a continued pattern of willful rejection hardening your heart, suppressing the truth, giving yourself over to your sin when you know it's wrong, and then dying in that state of unbelief that will receive no forgiveness. Now go back with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. Because in Matthew chapter 12, as Jesus responds to the Pharisees' accusation, he gives two arguments. They're so powerful to prove that he does his miracles by the power of the Spirit. And I just want to say, there's some real encouragement for us here. And the reason why is because we're going to learn and see more clearly who Jesus is. 
And as we see who Jesus is, his power, we should stand in awe and marvel and worship our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at what he says in verse 25 as he gives his first argument to prove that his work is done by the power of the Spirit. It says, knowing their thoughts. Now when you read in verse 24, but when the Pharisees heard it, you might get the impression like I originally did when I began studying this text, that the crowd is over here shouting, is Jesus the Messiah? And then the Pharisees are over here shouting, no, he does what he does by Beelzebul. It's the prince of demons that he cast out demons. But apparently that's not actually what happened. See, probably what was happening more is the Pharisees were going around in the crowd saying to people personally, or even saying to each other, hey, don't actually think that he's the Messiah. No, what he's doing, that miracle that he just performed, is by the power of the sp- Satan. And here Jesus is displaying his divinity, showing and proving that he is God. How? He can read their minds, he knows their thoughts, he hears what they're saying when they don't say it to him. See, I don't know what you think about Jesus here this morning, but Jesus is God and he knows what you think. He's omniscient. He knows all. And so he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And this is just a logical argument. If there is division in a kingdom or division in a house, that division will tear the house apart. And so then he says this in verse 26. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Do you see Jesus' argument that he's making right here? He's basically saying to the Pharisees, are you guys serious? Listen to yourself. You don't even make sense. I just delivered this man of a demon. And you guys are coming along saying that I did that by the power of a demon? Why would one demon deliver a man from another demon. Demons are on the same team working together to oppose God. Argument number one, you could write it down like this, Satan isn't stupid. That's what Jesus is saying. You guys are saying that I'm doing this by the power of Satan? You guys don't even get it. You don't even make sense. You don't understand how this whole works. Satan is not stupid. Now we like to say here at Compass HB, spoiler alert, we've read the story We get to the back of the book. We know how this ends. Jesus wins. Satan loses. But Satan isn't stupid. And then Jesus gives a second argument to prove that he does his work by the power of the Spirit. Look at verse 28. He says, But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, which it is, then the kingdom of God has come upon you, which is such a powerful line that Jesus just said in their presence. The kingdom of God is here. Verse 29, or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Now, just a little personal story from my own life this past week. This past week, I was woken up in the middle of the night hearing a noise like someone was inside of our house. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but it was very scary. And I got up right away. But if something like that's ever happened to you, you might know what it was like for me. Because even though I got up right away, still in that one second of me getting up at the sound of a noise in my house, I thought a thousand thoughts. Has that ever happened before? It was like, dude, is there someone in my house right now? Dude, am I getting robbed? Dude, wait, why am I still here in bed if I'm getting robbed? Wouldn't he come and kill me first? Oh, maybe he's going to rob me and then he's going to kill me. Like all of those thoughts went through my head in that one moment. Like, if you never thought these things through before, like, what would you do if there was a home intrusion? You need to think these things through, okay? What would you do if you're walking through a parking garage and a stranger starts walking to you and you're all alone? Okay, I am your high school director. I love you, and I want to equip you for all things in life, not just what the word says. You need to be prepared, all right? You need to think these things through. You need to have a plan of attack. How are you going to? Now, it just ended up being a raccoon on my roof. But all of those thoughts popped through. And it was really interesting to, to be in a situation this past week where I had a moment where I was thinking, my house is getting robbed. Am I going to die? Because of this text and what Jesus just said in verse 29, I took a minute this past week to actually study burglaries. How do home invasions typically work? 
And it was really interesting for me to find out that if someone's going to rob a house but not plan on killing the homeowners, what the burglar will do is they will tie up the homeowner first and then rob the person because apparently there are some studies that have been done. I don't know who does these studies, but some studies have been done that if someone robs you and you find out about that and you're home, you get like 50 times stronger because of all the adrenaline. So if you actually end up in the setting where you're face to face with a burglar in your house, you're so strong that you are more likely to take that person down. I read that and I was like, all right. I feel pretty good about myself. Now, you can see on your handout that at the bottom right, I included for you a couple of QR codes to some helpful articles on today's topic. And one of those articles is by a guy named Sam Storm on uh, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And he said this, I just want to read it to you about verse 29 because I think it's so helpful to understand what Jesus is saying. Sam Storm said this, Satan is the strong man in verse 29. And his house is this present world. And his goods or his property are the men and women whom he holds in darkness and spiritual bondage. But with the coming of Jesus, someone stronger has appeared. And he has conquered him. Jesus has come to plunder Satan's kingdom by rescuing men and women who have been held captive to do his will. This is argument number two. You could write it down on your handout. Jesus is more powerful than Satan. Jesus and Satan might be at war, but they are not rivals. I know we might think about it like that, right? Jesus and Satan are rivals. You got to understand that's not how it works though. You want to know why? Because when you've got a rivalry, both parties stand a chance, right? Like if you take Marina and Huntington Beach, actually that's a bad example because Marina can't win anything. But if you take two rivals, somebody came up to me last night after I said that, and they were all feisty. And then as we were talking, they were like, actually, you're right. That's so true. You take two rivals, both parties stand a chance. It is so clear in the Bible. Satan doesn't stand a chance. Jesus is more powerful. He wins. See, Satan might be the God of this world who is blinding the minds of the unbelievers, but Jesus Christ is faithfully at work opening people's eyes, saving souls, and building his church. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 tells us, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus is stronger than Satan. And so look at Jesus' concluding call in verse 30. This, I believe, is the point of the passage that we can apply to our lives based on all of these amazing truths that Jesus teaches us about forgiveness and unforgiveness. And after Jesus reveals who he is as God, he says this in verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus makes it so clear, when it comes to Jesus, there is no middle ground. He says to the crowds, so are you with me? Because if you're not with me, you're against me. Do you gather with me? Because if you don't gather with me, you're going to scatter. You're either all in for Jesus Christ, or he says, you're completely and totally against him. So write this down for point number two here this morning. Full send with Jesus. Full send with Jesus. The time has come for every single one of us here this morning to evaluate our own lives, our own hearts, the way that we live our day-to-day lives. Have you full sent it with Jesus? Are you all in? Are you with him? Because if you're not with him, you are against him. And let me make one thing very clear for everybody here this morning. You do not want to be against Jesus. Jesus wins. He will destroy his enemies. And right now, he is offering forgiveness to you if you are his enemy. Do not wait until it's too late. I don't know if you ever heard that idea before of a lukewarm Christian. Have you heard that idea before? Let's make it very clear here this morning. There is no such thing as a lukewarm Christian. Jesus says to the lukewarm person in Revelation chapter 3 that he is going to spit them out of his mouth. That's not a Christian That's someone that Jesus wants nothing to do with. 
James chapter 4, verse 5 says, Do you want to be a friend of the world? Then you make yourself an enemy of God. There is no such thing as someone having one foot in the church living for Jesus on the weekend and then one foot in the world living how they want the rest of their lives. If you're not all in with Jesus, he says you're completely and totally against me. Take your pick. Choose your side. Jesus has drawn the line in the sand. He requires complete, total commitment if you want to follow him. And I want you to actually notice the details of what Jesus says in verse 30 about this all-in, total, complete commitment that he requires from his followers because he says in verse 30, whoever is not, and then notice this right here, with me is against me. And whoever does not, notice this, gather with me, scatters. See, there's two things that will mark every true, genuine Christian. You want to know if you have full sent it with Jesus? Christians spend time with Jesus. And Christians gather to worship Jesus. We often say, I, I, if you haven't heard me say it, you've probably heard Pastor Bobby say it, or maybe your small group leader, or a brother or a sister here at United has said it to you. Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. Relationships mean You'll spend time with that person because you love that person. And the way that Christians spend time with Jesus is by reading his word and talking to him in prayer. And so let me ask you, do you spend time with Jesus? And let me also ask you, are you committed, not out of duty and obligation, but out of joy and delight, like it's the desire of your heart, something that all week long you're looking forward to and you can't wait because you just want to experience it? Are you committed to gathering at church with God's people for the purpose of worshiping Jesus? Bringing him glory and honor? I'm not trying to guilt you here this morning make you feel bad or burdened. I'm trying to remind you that if, if you are in this relationship with Jesus, if God has forgiven all of your trespasses and you are now his son or his daughter, these are and they will be the new desires of your heart. If you're a Christian, don't you want to spend time with Jesus? Don't you love gathering at church to sing the worship songs, to study the word, to be with Jesus? These are not have tos. These are get tos. 1 Peter 2 2 through 3 says, Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk of God's word, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. See, if you've tasted that the Lord is good, if you've seen, if you know who God is, you know what you'll want? You'll long for the Bible. You'll crave the Bible. You'll desire the Bible. You'll want God's word. Psalm 34, verse 8, we just read it a couple of weeks ago. Oh, it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Jeremiah 15, verse 16, your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. Psalm 119, 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord, one thing that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. See what the heartbeat of God's people is throughout the Bible from cover to cover. I want to spend time with Jesus. And so how do I spend time with Jesus? I love his word. I'm in prayer and I gather at church to worship him. I just want to be in his house gazing at his beauty because I'm with him and I love him and I desire him. Have you full sent it with Jesus. Are you all in? See, if not, I know that today is just a normal day at church, but it can be the best and most important day of your life here today. 
where you can turn to Jesus in repentance and leave your sin behind and follow him from this day on forevermore by faith, trusting in him as your Lord and Savior. And he will forgive every single one of your trespasses. Rest assured there is no sin too great that causes you to cross the line that God cannot forgive. So come to him by faith. Now I, I personally... I know we got some seniors here in the room, and we're going to make these the best last two weeks of United we possibly can. But I also, for those of us who are remaining, am so excited for all that we have coming up at United this summer. As a matter of fact, right now, my good friend, Spamuel Cash, is going to come down the middle aisle, and he's going to start passing out. We've got summer calendars for everybody. So that way you can see how you can be involved here at United in the month of June and the month of July and all the way to the end of August. You can see what we're going to be teaching on on the weekends. You can see when we've got our small groups. You can see that we're going to be dropping a new episode of the United podcast every Tuesday throughout the summer. We've also got some super fun things like on June 25th. Sunday afternoon, once United is done, you're all invited over to my new house where we're going to have a summer barbecue to kick off the summer, a little fun day of fellowship. Also, throughout the summer, we're going to be having a girls' book club that you can be a part of. We're going to be having a guys' book club that you can be a part of. We've got a special series that we're going to be teaching through and doing small groups about on Thursday nights. And then we've got our big events of the summer. We've got Missions Week at the end of July. And for the first time ever, something that I'm super excited about, at the end of the summer, August 25th through the 27th, the last weekend, we're doing back-to-school camp. Because, uh, yeah, most, most high schoolers are going back to school that next week. And so before you go back to school, we're going to take you away to camp because you're not going back to school. You're going back to your mission field. And so we're going to talk about how to make disciples and how to do the work of evangelism. And so there will be plenty more announcements coming up about all these events. We'd love to have you be involved this summer at United. Let me pray, and then we'll close out our service by singing one last song of worship all together here this morning. Let's pray.